All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode eight. I've got about six more species for you, and I'm tucking in three mini lessons. If you've watched any episodes before, you know these mini lessons will have to do with general biological or ecology subjects. It might have to go over technical terms, things like that. So of the six species represented in this episode, two of them were completely new to me. Two others I actually only knew from the genus, and I needed more precise information to figure out the exact species, and two others I was familiar with. So this mini lesson's about field guides. I mentioned in my very first episode how important getting a field guide was, and you'll find them indispensable. There's also the USDA plant database, which is very robust, but a printed guide will allow you several advantages. One, you can scan by image and stop when you start seeing plants similar to the one you're looking for. Two, guidebooks tend to have sections that will instruct you on the terms and the diagnostic criteria to figure out what plant you're looking for. And three, which is mostly providence, once you start using your guidebook, you'll get this phenomenon where you suddenly recognize a plant outside that you've never actually noticed before or learned. It will just jump out like, whoa, that's rattlesnake plantain, which is one of the plants in this episode. This first plant was brand new to me. It was growing in this little patch along the edge of the forest, and I had to use my plant guide to look it up. This is Uvularia sessilifolia. This is known commonly as sessile leaf bellwort or sessile bellwort. Sessile leaf bellwort is the most widespread and common bellwort in New England. Sessile refers to the leaves originating directly from the stem, while the other two bellworts are referred to as perfoliate, which indicates the leaf seeming to surround or grow around the stem. It inhabits deciduous, and mixed evergreen deciduous forests, woodlands, and edges throughout New England. They tend to spread asexually by means of long underground stolons, with most plants in a clonal colony, not flowering. The flowering plants do not often set seed, but when the plants form seeds, they are in three angled fruits. This next one is very cool, and I was happy to see it on my walk here. It has a few common names, Tamarack or Hackmatack are sometimes found. It's also called American Larch. And according to the Maine Forest Service, it can be referred to as Juniper commonly in northern Maine, but that use is discouraged since Juniper is the true name of another species. It's most commonly found in cool, swampy areas, but can grow on well-drained soil. It is not tolerant of shade, so you won't find it crowded out in the understory. These specimens are rather young, but this tree can get up to 50 to 60 feet in height and around 20 inches in diameter. This is the only native conifer that sheds its leaves, distinguishing it from its evergreen cousins, and it turns a beautiful yellow in the fall. In fact, it's one of the last sources of fall color after most other trees have dropped their foliage. The wood is very hard, strong, and durable, and it is still used for planks, timbers, signposts, and pulp by modern foresters. While historically, the knees, which are buttresses formed by large roots, were used in shipbuilding. Now this one barely jumped out to me on the edge of the trail, and I needed my plant guides to figure out exactly which species it was, but I did, this was an example of one of the plants that I recognized from just scanning through my field guides constantly though I've never seen it in the wild before. This is Goodyera pubescens, or downy rattlesnake plantain. It's a perennial orchid and a creeping plant that divides on the ground surface, sending out short stolons. It may be terrestrial, or occasionally what's called epipetric, or growing on rock shelves. It prefers mildly to moderately acidic soils, such as in oak heath forests and is threatened in some states around this country, so you don't want to try to transplant these or move them. They don't do well anyways if you disturb the soil. All right, here's another one where I recognize the genus, but I wasn't sure exactly what species it was. Um, so I needed to use my plant guide, as mentioned in the first mini lesson, and slowly go through the characteristics to compare them to the other species. It's an elderberry, and I'll get to the specific kind in a second. 
Now there's several kinds of elderberries, so like we've gone over in other videos, you kind of want to get in and dig in and look at the characteristics. This is actually what's called red-berried elder in Europe, or red elderberry here in the States. It's a deciduous shrub. It can get up to four meters tall and flowers from May to June with fruits from July to August. The elderberries in general are very nutritious foods, though this one may require some preparation to limit the quantity you eat, as the seeds, like many plants, are poisonous. Now to distinguish it from common elderberry which grows around here, you can look at the base of the leaves, which are often uneven. Another distinguishing characteristic from common elderberry is the way the flower clusters grow, which are more rounded and pyramidal versus the flat top flower bunches of common elderberry. It likes moist soils and often grows in what are called riparian areas. These are areas between land and rivers or streams. The bud, leaf, fruit, and twig serve as wildlife food to a number of birds and mammals, more numerous than I will list, but include moose, snowshoe hare, and deer, as well as northern cardinal, ring-necked pheasant, ruffed grouse, red-headed and red-bellied woodpeckers, American robin, and many others. Apparently, the leaves emit a smelly odor when torn, but I wasn't aware of this until I looked it up in the guidebook. Here we see a pretty prominent patch of great burdock. This is another non-native species that would have been brought over. It's got the infamous sticky burdocks that stick to your clothes or your dogs. And it's got a really deep and nutritious root that you can dig up. Now depending on what you're gathering the plant for, let's say it's the flowers or the fruit, or in this case the root, that's going to affect when you're gathering the plant. So for here, because it's the root we want, we want to get it when a lot of the energy is still in the root. And as this plant becomes huge throughout the year and more of its energy goes into the tissues of the vegetation, the root is going to become less desirable. It's going to become harder and more woody. And then maybe through the fall and winter it will fatten back up. You'd want to dig this thing up earlier in the year. So maybe right about now. It takes a fair bit of effort because the taproot can go very deep. Perhaps in another episode we could talk about gathering ethics. Maybe this patch wouldn't really matter, but in general when you're gathering plants, you need to have an ethic of longevity in your thinking. You don't want to gather everything, maybe only like 20-30% of a certain patch, and then you would remember that and map that out in your brain for the next year. There's some seeds from the last year. Sometimes they're so sticky they can even stick to your skin. They have teeny little hooks that are supposedly were the inspiration for Velcro. Natural coppicing. Coppicing is a habit of some trees to be able to keep regenerating from the stump. Very common in maples. These ones have been manicured by the beaver that lives in this pond. But you can see it's really not enough to keep the tree beaten back. Coppicing is an underutilized technique that was apparently done in England to manage the forest there. It's a great way of keeping firewood going. You don't have to necessarily kill a tree. You could just keep taking from one tree, letting it grow back from that stump. You can see some pictures of some really old coppice woods, I think in England, and maybe there's other countries in Europe where you can find them. But I'd like to do an episode about alternative forest management. And coppicing is one thing that you don't really see or hear a lot in Maine, though I'm sure there are some innovative homesteaders doing that kind of thing. Maybe we'll find some. You can tell what kind of trees do it. Again, this is probably a red maple, but you can see it grows in clumps. And so trees like this, you could keep taking poles or firewood for cordwood and it would never run out. Cool way to make a small wood lot more efficient. Here's another new species to myself, something I didn't recognize and this is Clintonia borealis. It's called blue bead lily, or sometimes yellow Clintonia, which kind of makes more sense to me given the color of these flowers. It's another perennial flower in the lily family. It's usually found in patches, and while the berries are considered poisonous, the young leaves were often eaten in salads or boiled. They reportedly taste like cucumber, but I have no experience with that. All right guys, another episode of 100 Main Plants Down. Thank you for watching. 
Uh, if you like this kind of stuff, tap that like button or throw a comment below. It helps the algorithm recognize that this is content people want to see. Uh, YouTube doesn't give me any favors. I've been doing this for about four years. Not always consistently, but only like a hundred and something subs in four years. And that was my first goal was to break a hundred. So I appreciate you guys. It's been going a lot quicker this year, probably because I've been more consistent. So thank you again. Um, I think I've been making way too many comments arguing with shills and idiots about all the stupid stuff that's been going on the past couple months. So yeah, I might be shadow banned or suppressed at least, but who knows? Anyways, thank you again. Peace out.